So uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you uh, today. Uh, it is my turn. And uh, uh, my name is Ming Chao. I'm uh, one of the cardiologists at St. Michael's Hospital. And uh, today we're going to talk about the artificial intelligence and cardiology, especially in echocardiography, a brave new world. Um, this is a part of our ongoing uh, curriculum. And today, uh, this is what we consider the more advanced version of it. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to present. So the plan is to go over what is uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning, and machine learning. I want to give you some examples on uh, why we should be um, spending time to learn about artificial intelligence, because the machines are indeed coming, and uh, how uh, AI is going to be used uh, in cardiology, uh, echocardiography, and maybe ECGs if we get to it. How is artificial intelligence going to affect the way we practice echocardiography, uh, how we practice cardiology, as well as medicine as a whole? Um, this is one of my uh, favorite uh, uh, slides. Uh, there are lots of uh, interesting slides about uh, uh, artificial intelligence these days, together with, um, 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 with many other things that are for computer vision, as well as um, um, modeling uh, uh, images uh, using artificial intelligence. Now people are using artificial intelligence to model pictures that Van Gogh would be drawing uh, or uh, deep fake, um, you know, uh, uh, pretending to be um, uh, a political figure in terms of giving a speech. Uh, but this one is the one that uh, uh, how to actually use a computer vision uh, or, or artificial intelligence uh, or image processing to figure out um, which one is the chihuahua and which one is the muffin. Very fitting for a morning talk. OK, so um, this is one of the Steven Spielberg film um, that talks about artificial intelligence. And uh, it's quite a few years ago, but still, you know, what has been predicted is coming true and, and more true these days as we move along. Um, just to go back on a few slides on the history of artificial intelligence and how that um, sort of permeate through our society. Uh, one of the early work uh, that was actually part of it is done in Toronto uh, up in um, the um, um, uh, IBM campus on steels uh, is actually the Deep Blue project. And uh, in 1996, um, IBM came up with a computer called Deep Blue. Uh, it's a spe uh, specialized chess computer that was playing against, at the time, uh, the reigning uh, world-class champion, uh, Gary Kasparov. And uh, indeed, in 1996, um, it was a 4-2 to that uh, Kasparov uh, beats uh, Deep Blue. But uh, at least uh, the Deep Blue uh, won two games against uh, the human being. So that was actually uh, history breaking. And one year later, in 1997, actually uh, Deep Blue won uh, in uh, the match against uh, Kasparov. So moving forward a little bit, uh, 2011, uh, one of our favorite um, uh, TV show, uh, Jeopardy, uh, IBM uh, Watson uh, was actually pitched against Ken and Brett at the time was uh, some of the historical highest uh, winner uh, of uh, Jeopardy. And uh, indeed, uh, Watson was able to do na uh, natural language processing, understanding the question, and coming up with a prediction of the answer, and based on probability outcome, actually beat uh, the reigning champion at the time. So it's actually quite impressive. And moving even uh, farther forward uh, in history, uh, 2017 was a, uh, was a very important year uh, that uh, Google uh, came up with uh, something called uh, AlphaGo uh, and uh, beating uh, a number of the world champion uh, of uh, Go. Uh, and uh, the top champion at the time was uh, Oji, so uh, uh, KG. And uh, that, that was actually very important uh, as a landmark for artificial intelligence because, um, as many of you know, uh, probably among all the different uh, human games, uh, Go is actually one of the most challenging ones um, to do. So. Uh, with the variations and combinations and permutations, etc. Okay, so many of you may not know who this uh, lady is, uh, and but she is actually very important uh, in terms of artificial intelligence. Uh, her name is Jeannie Romati, and she's an ex uh, chairperson uh, and CEO and uh, of uh, IBM, and uh, she is one of the first lady who had that position. She's now retired, uh, and. Uh, she, she proclaimed in 2016 that 3D printing and IBM Watson, which was the uh, artificial intelligence uh, agent at the time that they had, uh, could replace doctors. So that, that's a, 
a very a broad and bold claim that she made uh, in one of the press conferences. So indeed, you know, there's been a lot of different um, sort of like, you know, hype and, and, and uh, um, that went on uh, since then um, in the 2015 and forward. Uh, and um, one, one of the articles that uh, radiologists are the earliest adopter in uh, artificial intelligence and many of the uh, journal article around that time, which I'll show you in a minute, that is all uh, pretty much uh, surrounding, you know, every single um, article has something to do with artificial intelligence. Uh, in their journal. So, and then it says radiologists, pick your replacement. Either you have a Watson, which is the um, uh, IBM Watson at the time, or Pigeons. You'll notice that we don't talk about Watson as much these days because like IBM had it like, you know, quite proprietary in order to work with them. It's really hard because you have to like, you know, um, um, pay them a lot of money or, or you have to, you know, um, do very customized, uh, uh, API programming, and uh, it becomes very complicated to work with them. So um, there's a Sloan and Kettering that worked uh, with um, with them on what's a cancer uh, project, and uh, but it was very labor intensive. So it ended up actually not as popular. And once, you know, Sloan and Kettering uh, did it, then, you know, going to other cancer places, then they said, well, you know, it's done with, you know, one of the cancer centers, but it doesn't necessarily feed us. So. So it, it never became like extremely popular that everybody uses it, uh, et cetera. So um, just looking back at the radiology uh, publications from 1972 to 2017, um, starting you know, um, with some of the, the early um, publications were uh, on computer-aided diagnosis. So lots of if-then statement, if you have this, then that, and that type of like, you know, uh, work that we used to do, but you know you have to program every single rule into it. Uh, this is how ECG is done. If you have used Muse or any of the um, uh, ECG cards that comes up with a computer diagnosis, um, a lot of it is just if then statement. You figure this out and you know the PR interval is this much, and then you say you know this prolonged PR or QT interval is that much, then it's prolonged uh, QT, etc. Uh, but it's really not a lot of intelligence behind it. So moving forward in about 2000, then you know the um, discussion started with machine learning, and then moving even more forward, uh, starting about 2010, then deep learning becomes more popular, which I'll go into each of these uh, concepts a little bit further. So how about cardiology? Very similarly, you know, um, computer aided diagnosis has been around for quite some time, and um, uh, uh, I remember in the 70s and 80s or early 90s, there were uh, computer medicine that we um, used to actually um, uh, listen to or go to and, and follow. And, and basically, it's like people have ECG uh, uh, information, and then uh, computer teams will be put together like hackathons and try to figure out which one comes up with the best algorithms of um, making the diagnosis of these ECGs. So that, that would be like one nice weekend uh, for the computer geeks. Uh, and then when you move along, you know, since 2000, uh, since 1998 and moving to uh, closer to 2000, uh, uh, 2020, um, you know, the numbers of um, artificial intelligence papers of like keep rising in the in the uh, 2014 period, a little bit later than the radiology, but we're certainly not too far, about five years behind. And then machine learning and deep learning all catching up uh, in the field. So if you ever read like, um, uh, any journal or like Jack or whatnot, and in the last um, five or ten years, you'll see that you know the number of articles that related to machine learning in the field of cardiology keeps going up, and we have to know something about it. And each of the conferences that we go to, either in cardiology or or echo or other parts of cardiology, will talk about this, and really have to have a fairly good understanding of uh, what's going on. Another interesting aspect is from a uh, uh, Netherlands Heart Journal that is summarized uh, the uh, what has been approved by the FDA. Um, this um, paper was published in 2019, and some of them you'll be very familiar with. Um, in in like you know we prescribed a, a live call like you know the little uh, plate. Uh, let's see if I have it on my on my desk. I'm sure all of you knows about this, but um, there's the plate that actually do uh, ECG. So they um, have an FDA approval for detection of AFib, and later on they had the six-lead smartphone ECG that you can do these days. Um, and then um, another one that we are very familiar with is Lumify, which is um, uh, from uh, from Philips, and uh, that's a nice uh, ultrasound probe that attached to our 
uh, cell phone or um, tablet uh, that can allow you to uh, help with uh, ultrasound image diagnosis. Uh, another one that you'll be very, very familiar with is Apple Watch. So all of us have some kind of Apple Watch. Uh, since ser uh, Series 4, um, 5 and 6 and now 7 coming out very shortly, uh, Apple um, has the detection of AFib that is uh, FDA approved as well as uh, Health Canada approved. Um, another one that uh, you may be hearing more about and I'll talk more about it is Bay Labs. Now it's called Caption Health. Uh, they, they do um, a number of different uh, echo uh, analysis, both image and view recognition, as well as um, as an uh, ejection fraction. So it's been a number of the um, uh, companies that come up with uh, automated EFs, uh, especially in POCUS. Okay, so then you're going to say, like, you know, why now? Like, you know, artificial intelligence has been around for quite some time. I took computer science um, about 30 years ago, give or take. And uh, at that time, I had to spend three months of learning artificial intelligence. At that time, it was actually very boring and just learning about class inheritance, like you know, the elephant has a trunk. So if you have a trunk, it's likely to be an elephant, um, et cetera, et cetera. But, but why now? Why does there such an explosion around 2010 or 2015? Yeah, a lot of it has to do with the computer science world. Um, these are the three companies that you're all very familiar with. And I told you Watson didn't succeed because like, they're, they're very proprietary, uh, similar to what IBM did for many years. But Google, uh, which comes up with um, Google AI, which has something called TensorFlow, if you talk to most of the engineering uh, colleagues and friends, they'll tell you that's pretty much everyone uses, including high school children, uh, including the, um, uh, my family uh, members. Uh, they're using TensorFlow at home. Like, you know, they can just program it online and you can go to the cloud, they can play with it. And, uh, you know, it just allows you to have something called open uh, environment or open API that uh, uh, you don't have to pay for it. And uh, so it enables these kind of uh, work that are done by almost anybody if you have access to it. Uh, even with a small laptop or desktop, uh, desktop computer, you'll be able to do um, artificial intelligence uh, work. Uh, same thing for Amazon AI. And last but not least, when we first started doing a number of these like image recognition work way back when, like to do one piece will be like 12 hours. But now with like, you know, the really fast GPU um, uh, boards uh, that are, NVIDIA is being a pioneer in this and is used in our gaming machines, uh, as well as uh, in, our, in, our, in our echo machines. If you look at uh, uh, what they have done in the last uh, few years uh, with the new machines, uh, they are now rather than using very customized boards, like each of them is designed for like, you know, Doppler or, you know, for fast forward transform. Uh, now you can actually uh, use um, uh, a common, like a, a board that you actually just bought off the shelf and they feed all, every, all the analysis through the software. So in many ways, if NVIDIA comes up with a much faster uh, board, they just plug it in and then you can, actually, um, you can have uh, much faster algorithms and uh, or much faster calculation using similar algorithms or new algorithms. So, so it's, um, it's really like, you know, um, make the upgrade of our echo machines so much better. And not to mention, this is a lot to do with blockchain, which cryptocurrency, which is the crave. So everything all sort of helps one another in terms of the uh, development of where we are at right now. Um, the, the other uh, major development, which I don't have this um, uh, label on, is actually Apple. Um, for those of you who are thinking of upgrading your portable, uh, the new uh, M1 chip actually has built-in GPUs. So rather than buying like graphics cards separately, they are actually building so many cores of GPU. So specifically on your phone, iPhone, uh, as well as um, the um, uh, Apple portables uh, or M1 chips on your Mac Mini or whatever, or later on hopefully Mac Pro, you actually have customized GPU that is built into it with the goal of actually doing AI on board. So even like at some point your your phone will be able to do like you know a lot of AI. Uh, things and one of the most common uses uh, in Google and Apple, they're now using AI photography. That's why your cell phone actually takes pictures um, better than very expensive single lens reflex camera that we used to when we were a lot younger. Okay, so this is a, a very nice summary uh, diagram from one of the paper that was written in 2018, published in Jack by Johnson, uh, that uh, talks about uh, artificial intelligence in cardiovascular medicine as a whole. So we look at the middle, which is artificial intelligence. It um, helps to inform clinical practice by 
using AI diagnosis and also personal medicine by doing uh, therapeutic selection for each of the people. And uh, through a different um, set of mechanism, in, including um, uh, novel therapeutic agent discovery, uh, new drugs discovery, physician decision uh, stratification. For example, you can have like, you know, thickened heart or, um, or like, or is that like amyloid? Is that hypertension? Is that something else? And then uh, even within um, a particular disease category, whether they are more sick than the others and prognosis of like heart failure, there's a lot of papers on this. Uh, you can help with uh, mining the data and integrating data um, uh, with the big data or the cloud. And also making us um, uh, healthcare professional uh, becoming more efficient and also uh, 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 more efficacious uh, because the machine quote unquote do not get tired. Uh, so that, you know, if you read 50 echoes, maybe at the end of the day, um, the last few may be um, less precise and the early ones will be more precise. So machines is not supposed to do this. And uh, it can give you like, you know, pre-collision warning so that if something's really abnormal or abnormal, you can point that out so you can focus you on the attention. Uh, another big piece that is coming out is uh, continuous remote monitoring and diagnosis. This is a big piece uh, since COVID and a number of different uh, companies uh, has been formed. A uh, good example is like CloudX, uh, TeleDoc. Uh, those are companies that uh, formed within the last few years that became household name, uh, especially for those who are interested in investment. They gone up a lot, um, uh, especially the ones that uh, has or Lavango that was in uh, traded in Nasdaq. So continuous monitoring is a huge piece because now uh, in US there's actually a fee code. So a lot of companies or startups actually focus on this area. But with, with that, it comes with a lot of data so that you have to have ways um, to try to figure out, you know, where do you actually um, find all the like critical uh, things to actually look after it. Uh, another one that is actually within uh, U of T is actually Mently that was done uh, by Dr. Ross Group. It's also very amazing that uh, leading the way of, um, of, uh, of this uh, remote monitoring piece for heart failure patients in particular. Okay, so, and then also the uh, EP people have uh, gone like way, way ahead than many of us in terms of remote monitoring in the field of medicine uh, for the pacemaker and ICDs. And last but not least, to optimize the resource allocation to find out like, you know, the most efficient way of um, using our limited resource and, and also dollars, uh, which are very important in our field in, um, uh, in me of medicine in Canada. Um, we also have the privilege of actually putting a paper together, um, uh, together with one of the, my engineering colleague from Waterloo, Joshua, and also uh, Sumit Gandhi, one of our uh, former ECHO fellows, we put together this paper that was published in ECHO a number of, year, uh, number of years ago in 2018. So in this paper, we uh, sort of give us introduction as well as a review of the state of the art at that point. Um, and um, we have this diagram that was customized, uh, custom, um, custom made. Um, and we talked about, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning. Basically, they are like a shell within a shell. So artificial intelligence really just a general concept of how uh, the intelligent agent can help to make decisions to maximize the chance of achieving its goal. In, a uh, typical story is the chess game that to maximize uh, the chance of winning by you know looking forward and analyzing the board. The next one uh, that is within which is uh, machine learning. So again, you know artificial intelligence. The concept has been around since 1950, immediately after the Second World War, especially um, so as pioneered by Alan Turing. Um, machine uh, learning, uh, which started around uh, 1980, the concept which um, is the artificial intelligence that use statistical method to improve with experiences. So we'll talk more about it. It's about like, you know, giving um, modeling and neural network similar to the, how our brain or how our nervous system work um, by looking at each node uh, that to branch out and maximize the chance of winning. And you have to pre-specify a lot of things uh, in that case. In 2010, deep learning comes into play and uh, U of T actually has a lot to do with this as well. And which is machine learning that use multiple layer of neural networks. So rather than specifying certain things, um, now the machine can actually identify specific features to go after. So not only um, it actually comes up with the outcome, but also comes up with where to look for a particular features uh, within a very complex set of data. 
So let's go over one at a time. So what is the AI, which is the big shell? It's the ability of a machine to perceive its environment and perform measured action to maximize its chance of success for a specific goal. This is a, a book that was uh, uh, written by Russell and Novick and, uh, and classic, classically uh, chess game is one of the one that has been used for um, you know, example. Um, and then this is Alan Turing, um, and he, he was made a hero in the movie, The Imitation Game, and uh, also is very well known in the computer uh, science world uh, by coming with his original paper um, in mind. Um, and it was published in 1950 uh, about uh, the concept of the uh, imitation game, which is um, how, can, how can you know if the machine is intelligent? And this is the test that is commonly quoted uh, now even in like you know uh, modern day um day-to-day uh, -day conversations um the concept is you know behind this screen um there's a uh, either computer pretending to be a human talking versus a human that is actually talking or having a conversation and then you have you or someone else trying to tell whether behind the screen is a computer talking to you or is a real human being talking to you so it's, um, you know, I, I actually went through computer science, actually talking to the mainframe and, you know, that was uh, entertaining. And, you know, there was a, there was a program that was written in I mean mainframe that, that pretend to be a psychiatrist. So it has a lot of these like, hmm, so what do you think? Hmm, ah, okay, I feel the pain. So, you know, there's a lot of these program into it. So, you know, initially when you play with it, it's really quite fun uh, way back when. And, and you, you, you have all these words about, um, you know, pausing and and empath, uh, empathizing the you know what what you're feeling and so on and so forth so um but can machine really do what we do so that is um, the interesting part so what is machine learning machine learning um, which is now the second shell that we just show you is a component of AI described as the process for computer to learn from experiences and perform pre uh, predefined tasks without prior knowledge so it can be divide into different um, aspects, uh, semi, uh, uh, supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised, or reinforcement learning. And most typically it employs something called a neural network. So the term uh, was originally coined by Arthur Samuel in 1959. Um, it gives the computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Because before 1959, you know, um, you have to program everything into it. And you really end up actually writing a program to let it evaluate. Um, I mean, I, I learned this um, uh, when I was doing programming is um, to do something called recursion that um, keep doing something called board evaluation. So you look at a board, like, you know, a checker, for example, or chess, and then you actually assign score to each of them. And when, when you learn chess, it's the same thing. Like you, you actually evaluate in your mind and then you look forward one to two to three steps and the more expert you are, the more steps that you can look ahead. And that was actually the time using machine learning and mainframe as well um, to, um, to actually program the computer so you can actually keep going down the possibility. So if I move one chest, what will the opponent do? Like, you know, if I move um, this piece, there are three, of, three ways that they can move and you have to reevaluate each of these um, possibility. And then you have to look at the step after that and after they make three moves, and each of these three moves will come up with another three moves. So you end up actually having a table to try to figure out, like you know, whether your your score of the whole board is actually uh, increase or decrease. Then you can come up with the um, winning strategy to make that next move. And in, it turns out in human being, that's what we do as well when we play chess. Is if I keep looking for what you if I move that piece, what would you do? Or like what are the three ways that you can do, and how can I make it better? Most people. Like, you know, like us, our amateur playing chess, we can look one or two steps ahead, but with a computer, you can program it to go like six or nine or even long, um, more steps ahead. So that's why you can like, you know, make, make the game harder and harder by letting the computer do more and more look forward steps. So um, this is another uh, representation that was in our paper uh, published in 2018 that looks at, you know, basically the neural network that is simulating the biological neurons. So, each of these uh, inputs will come into a node, and then each node will have different weights. And then we summate or, or yes, add up all the different weights, and you come up with an output that is suitable for your particular outcome.
a good example that's been quoted in machine learning often uh, in, in, in the artificial intelligence field is um, figuring a cat and dog. So basically, as an ex expert, you will say, well, you know, the cat has like, you know, this kind of fur, this kind of rounded face, this kind of pointy ears, uh, their fur color is particular uh, color. So you have to sort of like, you know, identify all these features. And the dog is like, you know, with the similar features of the ears, different and so on and so forth. And you have to actually teach machine, whoops, teach the machine about all these features. And then you go from there. A good example in, in cardiology world will be, you know, I have these patients who have heart failure. I want to predict its outcome of um, uh, 30 day mortality or remission rate. So we say, well, you know, it's the, like the MYHA class. So you put that in and then, you know, that's one, two, three, four. And then you say, well, what does the chest X-ray looks like? What does the BNP looks like? What does, you know, whether they have hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, and so on and so forth. So you plug in all these things and ejection fraction, most importantly, uh, in our field. So you plug in all these things and then you, you and then you, you program the machine to actually look for these things and, and um, you come over an outcome. And what is deep learning? So deep learning actually um, is a very interesting topic um, moving in the 2010, as I'll show you on the timeline. Uh, I just want to point out, this is a seminal paper that was published in Nature. And uh, most importantly, is actually from the University of Toronto by, by Dr. Jeffrey Hinton. And he has been working on this field for a long time. It actually made U of T quite famous. Many of his grad students actually became uh, very important leaders in the field of artificial intelligence, like heading like Google AI and, and uh, Amazon, et cetera. That's why, you know, when I talk to the um, students as well as uh, U of T computer science, it's very hard to get in. So, you know, for those of you who have children uh, who are interested in computer science, um, it turns out to be one of the hot place to be um, because, you know, there, there'll be recruiters for me to get you if you, if you are good at artificial intelligence. Um, okay. So um, then the next step is like, what is really deep learning? So um, deep learning was proposed to address the limitation um, rather than having to label everything and pre-identify all the factors that we know of to automatically learn the representation of the examples to extract the optimal features. And it uses a cascade of multiple layers of neurons to learn multiple levels of abstraction. With a tailored neuron, um, network structure, deep learning has reached and even exceed human level of performance and activities such as speech recognition, image recognition, and predicting activities of drug. And I'll show you some examples of how deep learning is used. A, a good example is like your, your iPhone, when you get it, you know, it's actually used deep learning to, 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 to actually figure out um, like where is the um, uh, uh, subject and then actually blanks out things around it. So if you get the iPhone 13 uh, and the new um, uh, latest iOS actually has that uh, deep learning feature and uh, so on and so forth. So, you know, it's coming very advanced and, you know, uh, real things can become fake and, and so that becomes challenging for humans to beings to figure out what is real um, in reality. Um, uh, this is another um, figure that we put together in our, in our paper and uh, using echocardiography as an example. So the image um, will be, um, uh, we're trying to tell whether, uh, what view this is. So we put in the, um, um, the neural network and then it has feature map. So the algorithm goes in actually, you know, identified feature on its own, what would constitute a parasternal long axis. We, we didn't actually program it ahead of time. We'll just tell you, okay, these are the 50 examples of uh, parasternal long axis, go and figure out We'll go and figure out what this is. And, and sometimes you'll be very surprised when you look at the heat map. Uh, we, we did this project actually, and we look at the heat map. The heat map is actually right in the ventricle. We, we thought it would be like, you know, the aorta coming out this way and et cetera, et cetera, the RV a certain way. But, but it turns out it's actually the shape of the ventricle that has the heat map. So when you look at the heat map, you say, wow, okay, that's how the machine figures this out. And once, once the machine figure out the, the feature that we need, maybe it's one or more than one or, or three or four of them, then it actually goes into a typical neural network and try to come up with the probability a particular image is what view. So for example, we, we taught the machine to recognize parasternal long axis, then we input a number of different things um, and uh, like let's say parasternal long axis again, and it gives a probability of what that outcome is. Obviously it would be affected by image quality 
and you know whether it's like you know whether it's lined up properly. So you know still still you know that that's actually very interesting. It gives you the probability uh, rather than actually um, um, this is a particular view and. And what we have to do is actually set up a cutoff. So let's say you know, the probability of this image is more than 80%, that is parasternal long axis, and this is it. So later on, when you see examples from other companies, when you do view recognition, this is what they do. Um, another paper that was interesting, I put it in for reference, was um, a primer for uh, cardiac sonographers about AI and echo that was published in 2020 in uh, JAYS. And in this paper, it talks about you know, some of the more relevant things about uh, echo and examples. Uh, and uh, it has a table about machine learning versus deep learning. And in machine learning, as I mentioned, it can perform small, uh, it can perform with a smaller amount of data and uh, can work on low end machines. Uh, depends on a specific function to reach a conclusion. Important feature must be identified the expert. So as I mentioned, let's say you are doing heart failure, then you have to identify all these features that we are familiar with already that we know has been used in other papers um, uh, that has been like important. So you pre-specify everything. It uh, doesn't take as much time to train the model and you use the statistical method to improve the experience. Now, deep learning, you need a larger amount of data, requires high-end machines, which is not a problem because you know the machines are not that expensive anymore compared with before, can learn very complex functions to reach a conclusion and also it creates its own new network weighting to determine the most important feature and do not need to be identified by an expert. So let's say now you have a data for heart failure, for example, then you know, rather than preserve first line, like the EF is important, um, it can go and look at all the data in ECHO and look at all the data in the history to say, well, you know, in addition, maybe the, the E prime is important or or uh, um, the, the peak E wave may be important, or things that we may have overlooked and didn't think of before, because you know, we may not have that capacity to do that kind of statistical analysis before. So, um, so, so you know, there's a lot of things that uh, we learn from neural network, and you know, when you look at papers from heart failure, for example, you say, oh, okay, um, it, it's um, something that we never thought of. Sometimes when we review papers on on the artificial intelligence, it turns out like, you know, how do you know? Like one of them I saw was actually like hemoglobin, it just pops up and it's like, you know, why? So then it, it sort of backs you the opposite. It's like, why do you think that is? <laughs> and you have to explain backwards and, and it may not be intuitive initially. Um, and then it takes longer time to train. And um, as I mentioned with the, with the faster machine, that's not really a major problem. And it also it mim mimics the functionality of human brain neural network. So sometimes um, the brain or our brain actually see patterns rather than a certain pre-specified way. And, and you know that by, like, you know, when you read echo, you don't always have a rule. You just pop up the pictures. Oh yeah, this is amyloid. And then, and then you go back and actually tell, explain why you think it's amyloid, but it just pops at you. Okay, this is again, you know, going back to our original onion shell about, you know, how um, deep learning is a subset of machine learning and so, uh, machine learning is a subset of AI. And, you know, it's been sort of moving forward. Okay, so now getting back to more the essentials of what we do as an echo person, I'll give you a bunch of examples of how echoes are used these days. So as you all know, we spend a lot of time um, in image acquisition. So having good images are very important. Uh, image processing and measurement, uh, interpretation and reporting. Each of these could be um, you, uh, where a artificial intelligence can be used to help uh, to improve our efficiency and also improve our accuracy. So indeed, the machines are coming, for those of us who are really into sci-fi movies. And this is one of the examples that was uh, from a journal called um, Diagnostic and Interventional Cardiology. For those of the uh, fellows and cardiology residents uh, online, I would strongly encourage you to subscribe to this. And I, I, I read this every week, and it's kind of interesting to bring you all the latest and the best development um, in, in cardiology in terms of tech, so you can keep up with everything. So one of the examples that they cited, there, there are many, one of them is actually machine learning software can help um, to uh, help as experienced clinical assistant augmenting the doctor and making workflow more efficient. So for example, in this case, um, the machine actually recognized or the reporting program recognized the views. And let's say you, we're doing ejection fraction and we'll bring up all the right views for you uh, rather than like keep going back and forth searching 
like the apical 4, apical 3, apical 2, and then the parasternal long and short, um, um, parasternal, yeah, uh, et cetera. And then bring over the right view, actually does all the tracing for you automatically. And uh, you have to adjust the edge if you want to, but, and then uh, it, it finds the systolic frame and the diastolic frame for you. So this is like the, a nirvana for echo reader, especially you have to read a lot. So in some way, you know, when we are very fortunate um, to have excellent echo fellows and trainees who work with us, but at some point, you know, artificial intelligence may be used to actually be created as a very intelligent echo fellows or pre-read your echo study, similar to what uh, we have been doing with ECGs for such a long time uh, by pre-reading ECGs for you. So you just have to like keep fixing the ECG, whether you agree or disagree with uh, the ECG interpretation. Another uh, development was, um, there's a number of these. I just cited one, one of such examples. So uh, Bay Lab was um, uh, a very um, um, uh, forward company uh, that's um, uh, based in San Francisco. Now they have uh, changed the name to Caption Health and uh, they created a number of things. One of them was uh, automated EF uh, software. Uh, they, uh, they have um, received FDA approval uh, for fully automated AI uh, echo analysis, especially for EF. Uh, and um, so they would take a picture with the right views. They can come up with the ejection fraction uh, based on the um, artificial intelligence. Um, again, you know, figuring which one is a systolic frame, diastolic frame, and then doing the automated tracing for you. Um, this is without contrast. Um, the other companies have done it for POCUS. Uh, another company was in Israel uh, that was actually based on the GE thing. Um, ah, this is another project that was uh, done by Caption Health uh, or Bay Labs. Uh, basically, um, what they did is they created a deep learning algorithm to help guide the novices. In this case, they used eight nurses and each of them took 30 um, uh, images of, um, or images on 30 patients um, to, uh, with the help of the uh, AI guidance, so they can, you know, guide them to the um, apical views and uh, apical four, apical two, etc. If you if you ever use the uh, butterfly, um, this is also a similar feature is actually in it as well, and it helps the guide no novices to actually get the right view at the at the right time. And uh, so, in in some way, it's good because with POCUS uh, during the training, they may have only like four to six hours of training. Um, like in like Saturday mornings or something like that. And then like the um, medical students and the um, uh, emergency uh, doctors, plus or minus family doctors may be asked to, to do this. And um, so with limited training, they, they can use the AI agent to help them to get the right views um, by making certain diagnosis. So this is actually coming. And, um, and this group is actually um, with very, very like, famous people such as Jim Thomas, Neil Wiseman, and Roberto Lang. So these are all very important people behind this kind of work. Another good example is Philips Heart Model. We, we it, it runs on the Epic. Uh, we haven't bought it, it's quite expensive. It's about 20K um, to get this. And let me just give you an example of how this works. So that was um, the uh, high model. That, that the particular feature has been around on the left side for quite some time, the left heart and left atrium. Um, and um, it's thought that, you know, with, with the 3D acquisition, it's like, you know, one button, you saw the analysis time in real time, that um, it, it will figure out the tracing in three dimensions. So you don't have to trace each of the views and uh, you can come up with the uh, more reproducible uh, 3D volumes as well as ejection fraction by 3D and also uh, left atrial volume, et cetera. 
Um, one of our colleagues and friends, um, Dr. Wendy Sang, um, has done a study while she was working with Dr. Roberto Lang in Chicago and um, studied um, 159 patients uh, and uh, using the heart model and base and compare that with the MRI. And what they thought, um, what they concluded is that the automated uh, ejection fraction using a uh, heart, um, heart model was actually very uh, strongly correlated with the uh, ejection fraction uh, and uh, with uh, the, the MRI. Um, the EF was underestimated and the automated LV uh, and diastolic and systolic and LV volumes were overestimated when compared with manual measurements. Um, and, uh, but the agreement with um, the, um, uh, the heart model and the MRI was actually very strong as well. So that was actually the conclusion and you know, we, we could have used it, but it's uh, actually quite expensive to get. So we haven't done that yet, but if we have a nice donation of grants, we can actually install that in our computer General system. General Manager of Cardiovascular Ultrasound at GE Healthcare. And today I'm excited to introduce to you the patient care elevated release of Vivid Ultrasound Systems. We've taken the extraordinary processing power of CSAM to a new level with artificial intelligence and an open architecture with vivid intelligence powered by GE Healthcare's Edison platform. We're linking multimodality imaging to our vivid systems to empower you with new insights, and we're expanding the image quality advantages across the vivid family to help you deliver exceptional results for your patients. Our AI-based tools have helped you measure and quantify data like LBQ and automated Doppler measurements. We're now bringing AI capabilities to the classification of images, so you now can read and review echocardiograms from a new and more consistent perspective. Our AI-based view recognition augments signature features like automatic function imaging to help guide your choice of the right images. This saves you time and improves consistency of AFI measurements, which ultimately supports exceptional quality of care for LV dysfunction and oncology patients. We've also expanded the use of AI to add more automated Doppler measurements to help assess valve disease so it does not go unnoticed because early detection is key. For evaluations that use multimodality imaging, particularly in the interventional guidance area, you can now seamlessly view CT and ultrasound images to bridge the communications gap. This feature may assist in interventional procedures by bringing together the advantages of CT imaging, orientation, measurements, and calcium detection by fusing the real-time ultrasound image with a patient's CT data set from any vendor. With our continued enhancement... So I thought, you know, if we show something from um, uh, Philips, we should show something from GE as well. And GE and now have um, some uh, AI-based uh, auto EF and also auto measurements uh, and also uh, auto Doppler tracing. So something you know is is um, they just come out with and uh, they're demoing it and we if we're interested we can demo uh, within our lab and see uh, what it looks like and whether that can help us. Um, you know if if um, some of the promises that was made by the uh, Siemens machine that's brought up with some of these um, uh, automated tracing. Uh, done early on, um, uh, it could save up to about five minutes uh, per study. So um, in some way, you know, if you do a lot of study every day, like 10 of them, then you say 15 minutes a day. So um, so those are efficiency, potential efficiency gain, and also potential consistency gain as well. Um, just to give you some examples of uh, disease diagnosis using artificial intelligence, this is one of the paper uh, that was often quoted, uh, one of the first ones that came out in 2016, by uh, Nahura. Um, they, they tried, one of the major problems that we have is uh, figuring whether patients have a hypertrophic endomopathy versus athletic heart. And they um, took you know, um, uh, machine learning algorithms to study uh, the echocardiography and also the uh, machine, do um, the Doppler. And they had a cohort of about uh, uh, 77 athletes versus uh, 62 hypertrophic endomopathy. They look at spectral tracking variables and uh, trained it, learned it, and overall, the sensitivity and specificity are very respectable, uh, comparing one or the, one or the other. Another one that um, we are also working on in our lab uh, with Dr. Ong and Dr. Vesner, and um, is the artificial intelligence um, looking at uh, cardio amyloid, and also this is uh, in conjunction with Dr. Mo as well. And this is a paper that actually worth reviewing uh, within our group as well uh, in preparation of our study. Uh, it's published in Nature Communications, and I'll send it out to uh, people are interested. 
And um, what they did is they used two different methods. They have the ECG method and they have the uh, three different hospital, Brigham and Women's um, uh, and the Mass General and UCSF. And they can achieve uh, by using the um, uh, machine learning method in this case, uh, AUC actually very respectable, 0.5 to 0.91. Then they do the echo recognition, and uh, we have, they have control versus uh, cases of amyloid, and then they achieve significant, like you know, really almost perfect uh, in some cases in five of these hospitals, including now Northwestern and Keio in uh, Japan. And uh, and then in, in addition, they use two pieces. They use the ECG uh, information, and then followed by echo. So sort of like what we do in our day-to-day -day basis, they can even achieve higher of uh, screening. But obviously in the day-to-day -day use, one of the challenges, amyloid is actually not that common. So um, false positive rate actually goes up if you're using it in the real world. But be that as it may, it helps to um, help us to screen through patients uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, just very quickly, um, uh, our group, uh, 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 me and Veen and um, one of the colleagues, uh, Dr. Uh, Joshua uh, Shen, who is a PhD in uh, uh, computer science engineering at Waterloo. We, we did this project called Echo GPS that we had the privilege to become one of the three finalists at uh, the ASC Echovation um, in 2018 and in Nashville. That was a, a great place um, to be uh, with music back then. And um, again, the concept that we had was, um, that was in the early days, we tried to actually try AI to figure out whether we can um, learn to recognize the views and uh, focus. We know that it becomes a uh, a big use and big growth and uh, image quality varies and novice actually doesn't have much time to train. And we decided that to um, um, develop something called the echo GPS that helps to guide, you know, uh, echo imaging. So um, we are able to actually um, teach the machine uh, using uh, deep learning, something called convoluted neural networks, CNN, and uh, to recognize the views. Uh, but what the twist that we did is, is in addition to learning the wrong views, we, well, in addition to learning the right views, what is right, we also taught the machine to recognize what is um, wrong. Like, let's say it's too far right, too far left. Like, you know, we intentionally had these images that is too far right, too far left. The machine will recognize these images and you know that it's too far uh, on one side and it actually guides you back to a certain place. In, and also foreshortening, that's um, something that uh, Janice is actually very big on to make sure that we're not foreshortening uh, the images. So if it's, if the images is too foreshortened in one way or the other, then we've guided the, um, the uh, we give warning and guided the person back to the proper view. So in some way it helps the novice to get the right view, especially for tracing of uh, left ventricular ejection fraction. So this is too posterior or too anterior, or, uh, the right view for tracing. Uh, we, we actually did it uh, with 50 volunteers at the time, and we have 35 for training, and uh, we have 15 for verifying accuracy. We were able to get uh, the four chamber view up to 95% accurate, uh, two to three chamber views around 96, and apical foreshortening, foreshortening uh, because it's technically a little bit more fuzzy, and 86-7% uh, is still pretty good. It was a good proof of concept pilot uh, solution. And I think, you know, nowadays in the last few years, you actually see Butterfly coming out with that. Um, so sort of like, you know, in a, in a tested mode similar to Tesla, the automated driving. So you, you still have to have a human being behind it to do everything, um, just like you have to have a human being uh, driving behind a Tesla automated driving uh, mode. Um, but again, you know, with um, uh, AI, the challenges are when you have technically difficult images, suboptimal images, uh, you have to have a machine that is fast enough to do real-time analysis, and you have to be able to recognize pathology as well. If you actually have uh, this kind of um, method, we can save uh, tens of thousands of hours of training. We can demo, uh, deploy in remote areas, including up in the space stations. Uh, and also uh, we can upgrade our existing machine and, uh, and uh, to be able to um, uh, use this kind of method to guide. And then uh, we can help uh, training novice. Another project that we did was um, using AI to uh, improve images. So um, on the original image, uh, we look at, you know, basically the image has a lot of speckle and uh, by using um, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, we can do a combination of uh, super resolution and also uh, de-speckling. And you can do a, com 
uh, combination of both to high, try to improve the image so that you can um, perform um, image recognition on these pictures further to make the pictures even better uh, from suboptimal images to start off with. So you can use AI to improve image quality. This is a paper that was uh, published in, a, uh, in the Journal of Cardiovascular Ultrasound. And uh, it, it's, again, a more recent review of this topic. And I thought the diagram actually shows a very good summary of what I was talking about. So we can use AI to help classify it uh, by like, you know, different uh, view recognition. So which view you're in, uh, present the picture. So once you know which view you're in, it's very useful because then you can like, create reading sets. So let's say I'm reading the right card. So I just pick out all the pictures that are related to the right card. So you don't have to keep searching around. Or if I want to assess the degree of MR, then it's like, you know, those are all the views that we pre-programmed. So you can get the MR stack, much like the MRI. Um, and then you can use uh, AI to help with automatic segmentation of cardiac cavity, such as um, endocardial border uh, detection or refinement, uh, segmenting the ventricle from the short axis view, et cetera, et cetera. And also um, try to figure out where the endocardium is. So, you know, in addition, um, to um, uh, giving contrast. Um, the other thing that you can do with AI is actually doing all the volume calculation, ejection fraction calculation by doing artificial intelligence driven endocardium detection. This is demonstrated by the, um, the heart model, uh, both on the left side and also there's a right heart module as well. Um, and also you can do uh, valve um, automatic analysis and there's some um, uh, method, especially on the uh, Siemens side that they did um, a number of these uh, automated valve uh, algorithm to calculate the ejection fraction, recognizing the valve, especially on transesophageal echo, et cetera. And also um, using AI to help us with um, uh, diagnosis of cardiomyopathy and also myocardial strain analysis. Right now, we know that strain, there's so many pieces of information that a human brain cannot fathom. And uh, so we end up being a polar pot and, um, and but there are, any, uh, there are many other subtle information that we could have actually picked up as well. So last but not least, GIGO, so garbage in, garbage out. So meaning that if we don't have really good images to start off with, so we still at this point need human to be able to, to get really good quality image um, to be able for us to do the analysis and then um, be able to um, do the recognition. So this is now the summary slides. So, um, as echocardiographer or sonographers, um, what we use is we train our eye and our brain to automatically integrate uh, multiple attributes of interest in moving image without statistical reasoning. And these cues jointly contribute to clinical differentiation of patterns. Uh, what, what AI can do um, for echocardiography and other cardiac diagnostic tests is improve diagnostic accuracy and consistency improve quality of echo acquisition and reporting, extract information that may not be apparent to the naked eye, for example, strain and 3D, reduce observer fatigue, improve timeliness of reports, and uh, reducing costs as well, potentially. And so here's the good news and the bad news in this brave new world. The bad news is the robots are coming to do our jobs. But the good news, hopefully the robots are only coming to do the most mind-numbing, spirit-crushing, saltifying, and isolating aspects of our job. Well, one of the things I prefer not having to do all the time is is um, uh, is uh, tracing the Simpson. Uh, you know, if there's some way that we can do an automated Simpsons in a very reliable fashion, and we just have to adjust for it, and making sure it's doing the right things, that that will be wonderful. And um, I just have two more quotes for all of us. Uh, one of them is by Robert Kennedy. Uh, and like it or not, we live in interesting times. And uh, this is actually uh, true pretty much uh, throughout um, any decades that we live in. And uh, this person you may not be familiar with, uh, his name is Alan Kay, is a computer scientist, also a, a jazz p um, a guitarist. Uh, he's one of those people who are good at many things. Uh, and he's also an educator. He worked on the Xerox uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in the Palo Alto uh, Prague. Uh, a project which predated uh, the uh, the Mac uh, and the Lisa. Uh, that is the user interface that we now use. Like he sort of like the guy who came up with the Windows um, and and the mouse and human interface that we use day in and day out for the last 40 years. And his quote is: "The best way to predict the future 
is to invent it. So let's do it together. Okay, with that in mind, I'm going to um, entertain any questions that you may have. Let's see if there's anything in the chat. Any questions so far? Dr. Dr. Chow, I'm wondering, um, the examples that you showed for some of these cases are more looking at the image itself and then having the machine learn sort of uh, what things should look like and then you know identifying it in a fresh image that you present to the machine. But I'm just wondering, uh, in terms of AI studies that are purely based on sort of written information or or values that you put in how does how, sort of how does the machine look for relationships in that sense so um yes so image is one of the most straightforward things that we started off with because in the last 10 plus years or uh, even longer we transform most of our uh, diagnostic imaging into digital so it's very much readily available right so it's you know you have a whole data bank of ct mri and and uh, echo images that you can readily get access to. You, what, what we have to do is actually find people to be able to label them. And in the computer science world, it's called segmentation. And uh, so you just have to like let them know this is an apical four chamber view of a patient who have amyloid, for example. So, and then you, know, then you label that, and then you get another one, which is like normal. Um, and, and similarly for like someone who has like mammogram and, and the mammogram, oh, okay, these are calcifications and you just like, um, denote them and by, by a supervised method of machine learning so they can figure that out initially. Um, so then the next barrier is actually all the textual information that we get. Remember most of the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis is actually all free from language. Like um, when we do our notes on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, initially it's all written now. Um, many of them now has been encapsulated into uh, um, uh, digital notes, which is like a major big crew, like not until very recently that we start writing notes every day um, by the computer. So now we have everything on, on the computer, but before it's all written. Um, the only thing that we could get access to was the discharge summary, but even the discharge summary may not have all the information, but be that as made, the discharge summary is more structured, but does not always have all the right numbers in them. For example, if a patient is a heart failure, what's the admission antibody BMP? What's the discharge pro uh, anti pro BMP. So you end up having to write engines um, to actually extract all that. There are companies who are doing that right now uh, and I'm working with one to um, look at uh, using um, um, uh, data extraction uh, through algorithms uh, uh, on these key elements um, to uh, in uh, EMRs, for example, uh, family doctor's EMR or, or hospital EMR. So our goal is actually to be able to use AI or rule-based method to try to figure out, you know, who are the people who may have amyloid that we missed, for example, or rare diseases such as like Marfan or Lewis Dietz and that type of thing. So I think it's a one step at a time. So initially the images are there, but that's why it's like, you know, we can analyze them right away. Um, and then the next phase is all the textual element, which is difficult because you have to have a la la natural language parser to figure that out. And then ultimately, what you want to do is actually combine everything. Like one of the projects I show you, it's um, they use not only one modality, but ECG and uh, ECHO to try to improve the outcome. Because we, we know that the more pieces of information, uh, the better it will be. I hope that answered your question. And um, it, is, it, is a, it is still a very early feel when you think about it. And I think I, my prediction um, is that in five, um, five years, as, sh as soon as five years and um, as maybe as long as 10 years, the way we read echo will be completely different. Like my, 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 my feeling is that probably the echo will be like reading ECGs. It'll be pre-read <laughs> at some point. And I know that different companies working on it. One of the, one of the big, um, a big one is actually from Oxford called Ultronomics. So that's a company worth looking at. If you ever go to like um, uh, ESC or ESC Digital Health, or if you go to like, you know, ASE, uh, those type of meetings, they, they, are, they are there. J, uh, if you go, yeah, they are, they are there. And, you know, they, they will be one of the major forces of helping us to actually read echoes. Uh, 
in the long run by identifying disease uh, pattern and things like that. Okay, any other questions? Jimmy? Yes, Bob. Jimmy? Bob? Thanks, yeah. What about, uh, are there any current limitations related to data storage, uh, you know, speed, computing speed, that sort of thing? Are we, do we need to get to a whole new level to sort of make this doable? You well, know, storage is a huge. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the good news is, the, the storage problem we have solved in the sense that, you know, the storage are not very expensive, uh, both locally uh, and also on a cloud. Um, and because there are lots of data farm that has been built uh, over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, a good example is Amazon, like uh, uh, AWS uh, or, or Google, or, or there's a lot of like, you know, storage, uh, both local and remote. Um, the, the big thing is actually finding the right algorithms and uh, finding all the data scientists who can work with us as a group so we can do things together. Because, I mean, similar to what we had a number of years ago, there's a digital divide where the engineers are not familiar with our problems and the physicians are not necessarily familiar with the engineering methods. So you need to have some kind of medium to bring them together. And most of these data is when you extract it out, it's not, um, doesn't really require a huge amount of storage, um, especially we're looking at subsets of data, especially image. Um, but, but then once you bring it out confidentially, uh, respecting all the privacy rules, then um, you just have to do the analysis. And, and fortunately, the machines are actually quite cheap these days, relatively speaking. And, and the, most of them are in thousands of dollars, as opposed to be tens of thousands of dollars that we used to have to worry about. And uh, like, especially because of gaming and blockchain, it made a lot of these um, technology available to us with, like you can buy a card, like the top, Graphics card is about two thousand dollars from uh, Nvidia, and and you buy a couple of them, plug it into your machine, and and uh, it, it actually works really fast. It shortens all the image analysis by 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 a factor of four to sixteen, as opposed to hours and hours before that like we can just churn through them in like hours. And and we've done it actually one time in Israel where we're in the final final moments of a project that we have to present. We actually churn all the data on a portable, a gaming machine portable. We're still able to do it because of the fast GPU built into the gaming machine. So with that in mind, we are slightly past nine. So I want to thank all of you for participating. And uh, don't forget to do your um, evaluation. I believe next week is uh, Remembrance Day, so we won't have a session, I think. <laughs> OK, thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for staying on. And hopefully you find this interesting. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, Thank Jimmy. You.